This is a production of Cornell University. Good morning, everyone. As Bill said, uh, we do have a long standing trials program. Uh, Penn State got into flower trialing in 1933, so you can do the math. But uh, I'm privileged to step in behind Alan Michael and carry this program forward. One of the first things we did was to add in ground perennial trials in addition to the annual trials. And all our annuals are grown in containers. And we don't tell people what they need to do. We send them an application form and they choose what they want us to do. So it's a very well-oriented program from the supplier company point of view. This is what it looks like if you haven't been there. Debbie, you can close your eyes. Take a nap. But this is Petunia Alley, and this picture is actually from uh, 2014. And numbers of entries fluctuate in our program. I think our peak was about uh, 2011, when we had 1,300 varieties. And this area has the capacity to do 1,600 varieties. So I'm always looking for more. Uh, companies to come in and more submissions, but we don't get to control that too much. I can whine and plead and cast and I go out to California and say, I have that place. But in most cases, the, the uh, roster is predetermined prior to our arrival at that moment. This is an aerial shot, and I apologize for the, the color quality on this because it was taken by a drone. Subsequently, Penn State's drone fleet was grounded by the FAA. <laughs> now we're back in the air, and uh, certainly we need an upgrade on the camera uh, photograph quality. <clears throat> but we also run satellite sites, or I should say collaborative sites, and uh, Hershey Gardens is the oldest of our collaborative sites. We do traveling in ground there, and Hershey Gardens staff and the uh, uh, Master Gardeners of Gotham County, where Hershey Gardens is placed, are <coughs> instrumental in carrying this out. So they're usually running about 70 to 90 varieties, a subset of our program. And by the way, we have about 950 varieties in the game this year. Uh, some of them will get a, a single rating and we'll give them all the funds because the plant died over the winter in the ground perennial case. And we're good at that. We have fluctuated winter temperatures and wiped out a whole bunch of dianthus one year. <clears throat> I talked to Jerome from Hilbert de Coy and he said, Yeah, but my plants are hardy in Siberia, you know. <laughs> the Russians are not hardy in Siberia. They go there, they die, but my dianthus do very well. <laughs> I said, Well, look at the ground. <laughs> we also do a, a, a subset at the uh, Ag Progress Days event, which is three-day event held up at State College, <coughs> and that's hosted at the Larson Research Farm, and that's a huge property, it's over 2,000 acres. But uh, during those three days, we garner typically 22,000 visitors. And this we added last year. I was delighted when the Master Gardeners of Allegheny County agreed to play in on our program. <coughs> and um, they have, this is a 3,000 acre park, there's a we'll stop. There's the park and where the red circle is in the center there. Uh, you can see the uh, area where these trials are conducted. Again, we're doing in-ground testing at all three of those locations. So it's a nice comparison to the largely container produced plants at, at CREP, which stands for the Southeast Agricultural Research and Extension Center. He thought it was a nautical accident. <laughs> This is your handout, and I didn't print any paper copies, but if you visit our web page, uh, all this data is up there. All you have to do is, is you know, there's three words. Anyway, uh, is click on the trial results, and if you were looking at, say, Angelonium, all the cultivars that were in the program have come up, the number of how many, and you can actually click this rating button, and it will rank them top to bottom. So it gives the viewer information that is a little more comprehensive than the National Trials database, which we also feed into. If you click on that picture, 
Then you can see the actual scores and comments that were rendered during that trials period. And uh, a number of greenhouse operators really are taking advantage of this if they're not in Pennsylvania. And we have some of the plain sec folks, the Amish and Mennonite uh, neighbors and friends who come out and they'll take a booklet, go through the garden, and spend several hours there. We also have broker salesmen who show up and bring three, four clients and they're writing orders right here in the trials, which I think is really great for industry and uh, we're, we're delighted to be helpful to the industry in that respect. <clears throat> well, let's look, I told you I'd talk about some top running, so let's get into that. And we have uh, over 63 caliber COAs in the program this year. And these are some of the ones that are best. And these top scores are based on the first grade. So remember, we can change this. As we go forward, we'll have scores that may diminish the standing of this plan. But this is the first grading which was conducted between July 2 and July 15. And it does take me about two weeks to do a rating because it's a 33-hour drop. And I get interrupted. <laughs> So, Kabloom, many of you probably are acquainted with this line. It was really exciting to see a caliber Poa variety come out on the seed. And I don't know if that's been passed through as a cost savings to the consumers, perhaps at some operations and not at others. But a number of these Kablooms did very well. And I'm only showing you plants that received a 488 to 5.0 score here today. So that's the top of the line. We went from one, which means mostly dead, all the way up to a five, which is a perfect score, a really good performer. <laughs> so there's Super Bells Coralina, and of course the Super Bells are proven winners. Introductions, and they are quite nice. Uh, they have a wonderful line of continues as well. We'll get back to that shortly. So both this lemon slice and the Coralina did exceptionally well in the first rating. You can see they have a nice tight habit, a lot of bloom. Uh, the foliar quality was top drawer, and overall growth was as expected. So in that case, that received a five. This was a funny little thing that happened. I know Bill and Neil know immediately what this is. This is a sport, and we get a lot of them. Uh, sports in horticulture back in the 80s and 90s. Quite a number of chrysanthemum varieties were brought out were actually sports of another plant. They had a yellow one, and all of a sudden a white branch comes out. So they cut that off and propagated it. We called proven winners about this and said, hey, would you like us to propagate this and conserve it and return it to you? Because this is intellectual property that actually belongs to the submitting company. And we have a contract with the submitters, and it states that directly in the contract. And so we're trying to clean it up. <laughs> so I guess they didn't want the support. I said, fine, I'll leave it on the plant. <laughs> but it's an interesting variegated form. If you know about Dan Himes, you know more variegated plants come out from him. But um, I'm not a keen fan of that. But this actually is kind of attractive with the white flower and the white margins of the leaf and these lines, these little yellow lines running through the flower. So that was kind of cool. <laughs> um, some of the other ones, uh, these are both proven winners plant, pomegranate punch. Super Bells Yellow also, again, very, very good performers. <clears throat> and we've had some of these in the past. The Pomegranate Punch won last year as a top 10% plant. So I think it'll be good for us again this year. The Choas love these plants. And the reason for that is we continually have a battle with alternaria fungus in the uh, Petunias and Caliber Coas. It's a, it's a fungus that is omnivorous, it attacks a large number of things, so we can't actually eradicate it from the property. If you remember, you know, your disease triangle, if you can break one of those legs, you can check the disease problem, uh, but we can't eliminate the alternaria. So the infectious material is always present at the site. <laughs> and when we get to that period, which is right about now, some of the continues try to drop a lot of leaves. You have to spray a lot of fungicides to keep ahead of it. And <clears throat> the Pachoas have no problem. They seem to skate right through that without issue. So Pachoa is actually a hybrid between Calibacoa and Petunia. <clears throat> and they're uh, particularly strong bloomers. They're 
colors are rich, and my hat is off to Sakata Seed for developing these wonderful, wonderful plants. Some of the other uh, Petunia varieties, and then, you know, Pachoa is actually the peak for Petunia market share because um, while they're named something different, they're really sold under the same auspices as we would have with Petunias. But again, these are some of the top four Petunias, and we have over 100 cultivars in, in the program. That's a little overwhelming. A lot of growers will come in and say, I need 10, five. Don't show me a hundred. It's overwhelming. But if you come back and repeat your visits to the site, then you can uh, obtain the data that you really need for selection and uh, development of your next year's cultivar on. So Easy Wave, they're from Pan Am Seed, as stated, and I think they're extremely nice. They have a good bloom quality, and they also have an intriguing color. Danzinger is one of our long-term participants in the program. And I'm very, very pleased uh, with what they bring to the bring to the trials. They have some very nice material. <coughs> the Palo Pink Lace is a, a striking variety. It's new. You can tell that because of that little gold sticker on the tag. <coughs> now, sometimes the company will say it's new to us, but they had sent it to us the year before under a number or something to try out that way. So when it actually shows up as a new plant at Penn State, we can fix that little gold seal to the, the tag. I tell visitors if you get lost in the gardens, just look at the tag and you know exactly where you are. It says bed A, plot number 29. Tongue of cheek. <laughs> so Capella White also from Danzinger was really good. And this uh, beautiful Cascadia's purple uh, diamond, I thought that was beautiful and it, it certainly performed very well. It's still looking good today, uh, three weeks after the first rating. So, uh, stellar job by Danzig. I looked back in our records at Penn State and discovered that we had over 180 entries from Danziger in 2010-2011. And now the, the man who had been working with us re-split have passed away suddenly. It was a big loss in horticulture and one of our friends at the trial garden for sure. So we're sad about Reese. We put out a bid and put all the dancing or material in there as a memorial to him for that season. <coughs> but anyway, now the singers on a different tack and they're going in and, and doing about 20 to 30 varieties per test site, cutting that way back. But all of their material is pretty impressive. <coughs> and of course, we have participation from Duman. And Duman is our second biggest uh, plant submitter to the program. So here's the sun tuning neon rose and the, the, the surprise blue sky, both are very good uh, plants, long blooming, lots of flowers. And uh, sun tuning is a little bit more trailing. Uh, the surprise blue sky is a little more of an upright color bar as we've seen. But both are excellent. Good colors too. <laughs> And we have other contributors. We're running over 36 uh, firms that enter in the program. Some enter one or two plants, others enter quite a host. Ball is our biggest contributor. We have over 230 entries from Ball in all their uh, subdivisions and permutations. But Ernst Denari is a real good company. We get the values from them. We get a lot of things from them. Uh, and this uh, success rose. And yeah, if you're publishing this, you need the exclamation point in there. <coughs> That's their doing, not mine. But anyway, uh, this was a strong performer early on. It still looks really good today. The Success Yellow has a little higher flower density. It's a little more compact, but it's, it fits into the line. And sometimes you see lines where they bring out a series and you go, why is this in the series? It doesn't look at all like these other ones. Mm -hmm. Or as Julia Child used to say, why is this right? not one? <laughs> <laughs> but indeed, this is a good line, and I think they're, they're going to perform beautifully throughout the season as we go forward. Some of the plants that are really, really strong, we've had a number of these blankets in the past, blanket rose, blanket violet, and one thing I discovered about those right away is they seem to also, like the Pachoas, have a strong resistance to our nature difficulty with the alternary blood. So here's a new one to us, Blanket Blue Star, and a very strong performer. 
ovation white from Kinsler, and Kinsler has a, fingers in a number of pies, including the Petunia department. And uh, you can see from this picture, this is a very, very strong uh, bloomer. <coughs> and of course, proven winners, super tuny line. And the, the breeders and salespeople from some of the other firms come in and say, it's so hard to beat those super tunies, especially in the heat and humidity Pennsylvania experience. Now, you guys up here are enjoying about a six, eight degree advantage over us down there in Landisville. It's very humid. Every morning you wake up, it's about 100% humidity. Maybe not humidity. And by the time you get to noon or 2 o'clock, it's dropped down to about 50%. And that's pretty strong. Go out to the West Coast and you'll find that if you get to 50% in many cases, that's remarkable. So while everything looks great at California at the CAST program, when you bring it back to our conditions here, things are a little different. And that's why a lot of folks come to the Landisville area from all over. We have visitors from Europe, yes, but also from about nine states surrounding uh, Pennsylvania. And why not? That's the lion's share of the population. Now, sometimes I kind of wonder about the name. <laughs> and I think, thought, well, maybe they, they chose that one after the two martini luncheon, which is a big reading team. But in any event, uh, some of these names are amazing, and uh, being a, a person with roots and perennials, naming there is not quite as esoteric as it is with the annuals. But they've got to stay ahead of the curve, right? <laughs> so there's some more super tunias, and they're all good. Probably the best selling uh, petunia in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, is super tunia just a bubble And I used to drive, I, I drive about 50 minutes from home to work to this experiment station, and I go along this uh, small highway, King's Highway, or Route 340, and you could count the number of this of bubble gums you could see on the route. Now, I have to say the market share is raising a little bit on that plant, because I've seen other things, like the frankenstein's. You all know about the frankenstein's, right? Yeah. We had a list come out this year, and it stemmed from originally African Sunset. We actually had it in our trials program several years ago, and I was out at American Taki, and that's their plant, and they had another really nice one, Trilogy Red, out there, which we were so keen to get in our program, and we had to throw it out. Because any GMO plant in the United States that's marketed and or distributed needs to have a registration certificate with the USDA, and it did not. So a guy in Finland who's a very uh, capable botanist, saw this at a train station, took a piece back to the lab, and discovered that, oh wow, there's a corn gene in here. Well, none of us believe that this is going to be an ecological problem or create issues in terms of our, our plant development here in the United States or But since it was a legal matter, there's no arguing with that, as you well know. We are, after all, a litigious society. <laughs> so we discarded about four varieties, but I felt myself lucky because the list came out, was finally published on June 16th, was over 60 varieties of Petunia. So I felt sorry for the, the big producers that had to throw away all kinds of product, and I hope they uh, did not have too serious an impact from it. Another group that's been showing some real promise besides the Super Petunias is this Deco series, and we have about five or six of those from Syngenta, and uh, I like Syngenta's products. They're, they're good. Most of them are pretty strong, but these decos are looking very good. They're doing considerably and looking like uh, very little fungal difficulties going into the near foreseeable future. So I would give those a second thought. The flower size is a little smaller than some of the larger petunias, but they're uh, good cultivars nevertheless. Here's Deco White, you can see what I mean, just loaded with blooms. And uh, this again was new to the program, it's indicated by that, that gold star up there. <laughs> All of the hippomias or sweet potato vines do very well for us, except in one respect. We have miles of turf at uh, C-Rec, and <clears throat> it 
it seems that the beetles, the Japanese beetles, invade these plants routinely throughout the last week of June, first week of July, and they have a distinct preference for the black ones. So if you're selling black petunias or developing those for urban landscapes, you're fine. But if they're going to go in areas where turf is, is uh, present or prevalent, you'll wind up with uh, some beetle damage. And I regrettably had to bring out some heavy artillery and chemical department to get on top of that this year. But I absolutely refuse to have our, our sweet potatoes looking like Swiss cheese for field day. That's just not acceptable. Well, having said that background information, these two came out. Solar Tower Black and Solar Tower Lime, and they're actually climbing varieties. Maybe you have them here at Cornell. But uh, really, a whole new market share for these. And we made some beautiful mixed containers with these spare parts, incorporating other annual and perennial plants. And uh, they're you know, growing up. They're about this tall right now on these, on these vines. And if I get back, take a picture, they're probably in a completely buried the structure that is actually supporting them. So uh, all of the all of these uh, varieties do very well for us. It's rare for one to wind up with a lower score than 4.6, 4.7. But uh, I'm keeping my eye keenly on these two. I think this is something very, very, very intriguing. Something else that I, this is one actually purloined in California this spring. I was visiting Cicada, which we do a fair bit of business with on crop entries. And I ran across this little birdie series of tomatoes. These are designed for containers. <clears throat> and this is the full height. And right now, these plants are so loaded with fruit, I can't even believe it. You could probably get at least two quarts off of a plant. And I should state that when we pot up out here, we take all our clubs that come from February through April. Sometimes we even are disadvantaged as to having um, entries show up in May. They all go into four and a half inch pots, and then we place three four and a half inch pots into this five gallon container that sits on the ground. This helps us standardize things going into the uh, trials and evaluation. But the little birdies are named for birds. There's canary, there's red robin, and so forth. And that's cute, but for a container that's on a deck or patio or balcony, a wonderful thing, and you're not going to have to worry about wind damage from these plants blowing over as we do with some of the taller varieties that are chosen for containers. So I'm pretty tickled about that series. We had some of these Thunbergias from Proven Winners, and I saw one at uh, Coa out in California that's actually a beautiful, clear, rich paint, which I've never seen before. <laughs> but I love this uh, Appeal Lemon, which is a strong grower, and it's also a nice color. It's Picture is a little overexposed. I should have shot it on a cloudier day. But the time being what it is, you can't always have that advantage. This plant has been with us for a number of years. Every year it gets a very high score, always winding up in the 10%. And the volumous blew my mind. It's true blue, it's a lovely color, and that's kind of rare. You start to think about uh, horticultural cultivars that are really blue. And there aren't that many of them out there. We've got Serrat, Stigma, Plum Bacon. What's that easier to say as Plum Bacon or anything? Anyway, here's a nice uh, light colored blue, a very strong bloomer for us. Uh, by the time we get into August, mid to late, this thing will be so covered with flowers you won't be able to see the foliage too well. It does need some fertilizer, so I've seen places where it's grown and not fed well, and the bloom, of course, is compromised in those conditions. One of my favorite American cocky entries is this Melancholian Jack Pot Gold. This thing has a perfect habit. It maintains that really well throughout the season and also has this beautiful uh, gold color. So very floriferous, very uniform, and a strong performer in Landisville. We do get some marigolds, and if you want to see marigolds, you really should go to the Dallas Harbor region. They probably have over 100 different color bars in their trial program. We get two, three, four, depending on the year. This one's from Pan Am Seed, the division of Ball, of course. And I thought it had a very strong bloom, nice color. It really calls to you across the garden, but uh, a nice habit as well. So recommend this highlight. 
we do get a lot of combinations, and albeit we have less this year than we've had in the past. Um, some of those don't do so well for us, others do great, and we wind up with uh, plants that are three of the same species playing nicely throughout the season, whereas if you have three different species, sometimes one plant will beat up the other two before we get to September and pretty much overwhelm it. Uh, these are uh, interesting combos. We have uh, probably uh, 28, I think, this year. Last year we had a few more, about 35 or so. And uh, here's one that is not really new. We've seen this before. I think it was in the program last year. It was Inventa. But it's got a good performance. And actually, for us, usually we kill most of our low bilious due to heat. But uh, in these combos, they seem to do nicely. So we're experimenting with why that happens and what we can do to encourage Lobelia to survive. We'll get up to 140 degree temperatures in those containers in a hot summer day. There are black plastic, there are black pots. And so we tried growing Lobelias in white pots one year. We got put in thermocouples and measured the temperature right in the, in the container at crown height. And we wound up with savings of three degrees. Not good at it. Anyway, this uh, night in Pompeii is a lovely color combination. All components are playing fairly, so we gave it a good score. Here's another one that's sort of like it. This is another one of these after the two martini lunch name choices. <coughs> but uh, mom's chosen one. I hate that. But anyway, maybe that's because my older brother had a little crap mom. <laughs> anyway, a strong performer and a good award winner in two years in a row. For our combos, we'll do two standing pots and a hanging basket. And it always intrigues me to see how much difference there is between the standing pot and the hanging basket of the same cultivar. Often the hanging baskets do better. Why? They're not sitting on dark stones, absorbing all that heat. They're getting air circulation as the temperature drops after the sun sets. They're getting a little cooler you know, root system. So those are things that help us with combos. <laughs> Thanks. See, I'm, I'm so glad this is here. Well, I, I, I'll wait. <laughs> well, these are two things that are proven winners' introductions, and they're great with virus. The virus has been around a long time, and it's nice to have these two cultivars. What happens for us, it's a very windy site. And so King Tut often blows over, whereas Prince Tut stays there nice and stocky and sturdy. So my preference, personally, is for Prince Tut, unless you're doing something where you need to hike, and then you just have to upright the pot after the wind goes by. Both of these are very good plants. Uh, I think the Prince Tut has a, a remarkable density to it. And uh, you can actually grow these in almost standing water. We had some of it. University of Vermont, where right, I had a pool in the greenhouse, and they were, were well. Uh, it wasn't the proven winners of the bar, so. Then we get things like this, where you see two plants, and you're out there standing next to them, and you're going, hmm, don't these look alike? <laughs> and that happened a couple years ago when we had super tinian honey from proven winners, and petunia uh, Indian summer from Danzig. And we're standing there, and I couple of board members, and I'm like, these things are identical. And my vice chair of the board chairman said, yeah, thing. Uh, so often a company will license something to prove the winners, giving them the opportunity to change the name and wind up with the same cultivar. And I don't know that for a fact. I haven't talked to both firms about it. But from a visual perspective, these things are bloody identical. <laughs> We've had a number of Gerbers over the years, but Flores Holland does a beautiful job with Gerbers. That's all they produce. They have potted varieties, they have cut flower varieties, they have garden varieties, and so forth. And you should have seen the display out at the California Spring Trials in Mott. But this one was in with us last year. It did very well. It's doing great again. Good bit of bloom for Gerberas in, in our zone and situation. Here's another one. Wow. Gerber a sweet glow from Flores Holland again, and a strong orangey color and a good flower form. So, real nice performance. Um, verbena, we have about 40 verbena cultivars in our program this year. Warren Gall is 
on my advisory board, seated in the back of the room, retired from Penn State Extension, but he's not retired today, he's on duty. Anyway, he was remarking to me yesterday that the Verbenas were looking exceptionally good this year, and I can only agree. So this is from Selecta, and it's a, a very strong color. It falls to you across the garden and has a good bit of bloom. Often, Verbenas will cycle and bloom. You have a very strong period of production of flowers and then a reduced period subsequently. So uh, that is a good one. And these Endura escapes from Ball are always good. Uh, most of them are very strong, but this Endura escape red is probably the best of litter. Last year, we were in a period of about seven, eight weeks of over 95 degrees. That shut down a lot of the Verbenas, and I sent my interns out to the garden and I said, I want you to cut back one pot of each variety and let's see if they come back before the ones we didn't cut back. There was no difference. So growers were cutting back the verbenas. Yeah, that cleans them up and makes them look a little tidier, but you may not be doing much food to enhance the bloom on you. <laughs> so Empress Sun from Dubin, another real strong color, but also a very good performer. And this uh, super bean cherry burst from PW. Wow, really nice color there too. And again, a good, very good performer. We have a number of lantanas. They do very well in the program until the pollinator insects have their way with them. And then we wind up with a lot of seed set. So there are two new cultivars out from the ball that are supposedly sterile. This is one of the Lumified Rose. And if it's sterile, we'll know. Because uh, Mrs. Stoltzfus or Mrs. Lack will be out there in their garden pinching all the flowers off. John Smith and his wife have two kids, one's in band, one's playing soccer. They're running like crazy. They both have jobs. They don't have time to do this. And so in our program, we try not to do a lot of mollycotting or maintenance of the plant. This is one that did very well for us, and you can tell by the blue flag and it received a superior rating on the first rating. But it also did very well. Last year, it's a compact variety, but the color is strong, and we just, the pollinators just love these things. We've got hundreds and hundreds of skippers out there. We've got sulfurs, we've got tiger swallowtails, all kinds of beneficials are out there playing with the lantanas. So the good insect support plants. The Bidens, the Bidens this year are really moving forward. There were some very large flower cultivars displayed in California, but uh, then we saw this one again from dancing. And the first time I'd seen a pink bite, and I was so delighted when it showed up in our program. It's blooming very well. Looks like it'll be a good performer and certainly unique. Here's another one. This cultivar, also from dancing, white delight. Another form of color we haven't seen in the past. So vitamins, which also are great uh, insect support plants, they're going to be very useful in their operation. Sadly, this year, Beacon Camp had a problem with their Slozies, and usually they send us 12 or 15 varieties. Uh, but we have a very short suit of uh, Bidens, or excuse me, Slozies this year. But here's a good one, Twisted Red from Ball Ingenuity. And it's a very strong bloomer. It's got that sort of brain coral look to the flower. But uh, it makes a good cut flower, I'm told. And it also has a very long period of bloom. So I highly recommend that. There are a lot of angelonias uh, in our program. Some people don't realize that these are plants that are developed from South American germplasm. And the reason they're such great plants in the landscape in the Northeast is the bee that pollinates these things are not here. They're, they're maybe in South Florida, maybe in South Texas, but uh, it's a bee that wants to get oil in its nectar, and the, and the angelonias have oil at the base of the nectar glands, so most North American species just avoid them. I'm going to switch over. We had a little issue with my computer, so I'm going to go into another series of slides here. All right. So some of these items you've seen before, but I wanted to bring your attention to this particular petunia. This is a sensation, which is the first petunia to receive an All-American Selection Award for fragrance. 
Now, if you want to check fragrance, probably ask the ladies to do that. They have better sniffers than us guys. And secondarily, you want to check in the morning when the, the flowers are fresh and it's just starting out. Um, you saw this. A couple of these have been done this. But yeah, they, I had to show you the super tuning bubble gum. Massive is something. Never mind. But some of these are really good. And uh, I ran through some slides and uh, took these pictures. There you can see the towers as they tower above their compatriots out in the field. And some of the other really nice verbenas that were looking good on Sunday. So uh, strong performers all. But what I really wanted to get to, and let me. Uh, was the begonias and the patients. This was something that we saw uh, out in California. And Jennifer Cousy from Duma drew my attention to it immediately. And I said, wow, it's a double beginning. And what you're seeing there is you get you know, actually sort of rosebud shape to the flowers as they begin to open. And there are several cultivars that we have, but this one is, is pretty much the strongest, the wild ranch flush paint. So a really strong player. We also have patients are a uh, large component of the program. Many are tested in the sun and shade. Here's one from Selecta that's pretty good. Nice strong color. Some of the varieties have bigger flowers, but less of them for you in area plant. Others have a lot of uh, uh, small flowers and the plant pretty much is covered with them. But these, these Pavonia are uh, megawatts, and they're also the whoppers of the big green leaf series, the big red leaf series. Amateurs can't really tell them apart, but they've all been touted as the best landscape Pavonia's going. And I can only but agree. Last year we were having, in Canada, including the pot, they were standing up about four, four and a half feet at the end of the season. So clean as a whistle, and one of the things we really sweat at Landisville, Xanthemonas, Pagoni problems, Xanthemonas, Pelagoni is the cause of the organism. And for the angel wings and non stocks and readers, it's a systemic problem. So here's another patient, really good grower. And here's some of the Hilbert and Food Pagonias. This is a Viadore Amaretto. It has a really strong color to it. Um, here's a close up of that. And then, of course, bounce. Big bats. And these are uh, selected intros, and man, they just flower their heads off. I'll never forget when they sent us a promotional video of about 18 seconds of the plant sitting there. You can see a clock turning on the wall rapidly. The plant starts to wilt and collapse. And then it starts, to, and the audience goes, oh. And then it starts to rain, and you can watch the plant rehydrate and come back to full glory within a very short period of time. That's why they need bats or big bats, but they're excellent. And just look at the flower power on that plant. And you can also see if one awards three years in a row, every time that happens and it's in the top 10%, we put that little blue sticker on with the year they appended. Here's the bright coral, very strong, lovely plant, and uh, just beautiful, beautiful. Uh, Kingsler has these paradise varieties. They're big flower, they're very strong growers, and again, this one won two awards in the past. Here's White Rose, again from Kingsler. And just look at that performance. That's a glorious plant. There's nothing to complain about with the Kingsler line. <clears throat> um, Benari has these lovely non stops, and I'm delighted to say we only have one cultivar of begonia that has gotten the Xantho problem this year. Look at that strong color. That is just Beautiful window boxes for herds, for containers, mixed plantings. These things are a great component. They're going to stay rather compact, and you can put your upright stuff in there, or maybe a, a solar tower. But they're a really strong color. They entered three white forms. This one is my favorite. We don't rate on my favorites. We rate on uniformity, flowering, foliar quality. And all growth, so it's a pretty objective rating system and fairly consistent with what other folks are doing. Just look at that plant. That's a beautiful, beautiful uh, white. You know, we've already put the 
fast. So we'll skip on a bit. There's your megawatts turned in sun, and both the megawatts and the walkers are testing in sun and shade. In the sun, the bloom is a little more strengthy. In the shade, the plants are a little bigger. So depends on how you want to culture them, but they grow beautifully in, in all conditions. And walkers and megawatts, and it only has to prove the winners brought out too this year as well. They were pretty, pretty close to the others, but excellent, excellent landscape plants. And all the board members on my, I have a 46 member board. <laughs> and I always tell people I'm so grateful they don't all come to the meetings, we never be able to decide a thing. But they all agree these are the best landscape pneumonias on the market. So they're, they're particularly nice performers, I think. It's like a boot. Anyway, a Surefire Rose, another one. This is from PW. That's their pink variety, and they have a Surefire Red to go along with it. Yep. And again, it resembles those other cultivars very strongly. So there may be duplication, but that's a good thing in my opinion in horticulture. Because should there be some subtle nuance that's going to create a problem for one of those introductions, perhaps the others will not be impacted. So it's a really good opportunity to uh, check that out. Sakata so does a great job with their impatience lines too. And we're not really advocating that folks grow the wallerianas, I understand. Our Bridget is working on developing some, some uh, disease resistance in the Wallerina lines for Ray because the customers love them and the nurseries and greenhouse operations would like to market those plants as they were the number one bedding plant in the past. But in the meantime, we can grow these beautiful uh, New Guineas and hybrids concerning them. <coughs> this is a, a vegan camp variety, Carmen. Another one of these non-stock types, gorgeous, beautiful flower, lovely size, lovely quality. But this was my favorite, Chloe. And maybe that's my pastel color preference. I like to get my wife and daughter arguing about flower colors because Erica, my daughter, is an art graduate from Temple High Art School. She loves the rich, strong, vibrant colors. And my wife, being a conservative, she traditional prefers the pastels. So it's fun to get those discussions going together. There's Chloe in all her glory. And she was very, very nice. There's a nice apricot variety, um, which again is a great flower size and uh, real attractive. We do have a number of angel wings. I love this one. It's a little hard to get a good picture of this unless you want to lie on your back and shoot up the pot or get somebody to hold the pot up in the air. But in any event, this is a very good plan, in my opinion, great for trailing. And it does have that wonderful solid white color. <clears throat> well, I think I've uh, run, run the gamut of my time schedule. I thank you all very much for your attention and to encourage you, if you've not visited the Penn State Flower Trials, come down. You can go see us, you can go to Longwood, you can go to Chanticleer. And as somebody once told me, there are more botanic gardens within striking distance. Philadelphia is back anywhere else in the Much obliged for your attention and I encourage you to come see us down in the wings. Thank you.
Yes. Uh, yes, I have, and they're very good. Um, I, I wouldn't consider myself a tomato flavor expert, but I'd say the little birdies can go in my salad anyway. Yes? It's trialgardenspsu.com. It's not a .edu site because IT looked at the complexity of it and ran away. And I think you could Google it. Yeah. You could just do Penn State Flower Trials and Mr. Google will get it right there. Uh, any of the verbena varieties uh, less susceptible to cycling or better? Well, those endurescapes are pretty good in that respect. And uh, there's some of the lanai's that are good too. There's a, one came out a number of years ago, Vintage Vodka, and now there's some subsequent generational plants bred in that same color line. It's not as strong as the purples and red. It's sort of a creamy, light green, yellow color. But that thing blooms throughout last year's heat with no, no attrition whatsoever. Thanks. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.